Since the beginning, human beings have been curious about the natural world around us. Searching out, collecting, and naming every living thing. This curiosity reached a fervor with the formal study of natural history centuries ago in the Age of Enlightenment. Scholars, clergymen, military officers, adventurers, and eccentrics of all kinds traveled the world seeking new species. Their obsessions gave birth to the modern life sciences of botany, zoology, and paleontology. The museums of the world preserve past collections and additions are being made every day. Today, with species disappearing at an alarming rate, this work has taken on a new urgency. During the past decade, the New Brunswick Museum has been staging two week-long bioblitzes to record as much of this biodiversity while it is still available. To see dramatic changes over the next uh, decades, uh, certainly over the next hundred years, there will be tremendous changes. And uh, right now we feel a tremendous amount of pressure to try to document those changes as they're, as they're occurring, to try to ensure that we're able to uh, collect material while it's still available, so that it can be available for research in the future. So we're expecting very significant changes to occur. And one of the problems in trying to document changes is, is that you need a baseline to work from. You need to know what things were like in the past so that you can in fact recognize those changes when they occur. And what we really are lacking in many cases is that uh, data from the past. So we want to be sure that in the future that uh, uh, researchers who may be trying to get a better handle on what's happening in the, in the Acadia Forest and the environment generally in New Brunswick have adequate material to, uh, to document those changes and understand them. I delight in the bio blitzes because it's essentially summer camp for grown-ups. I meet other people with similar but not identical interests. These people are very pleasant to spend time with. I learn something all the time. As to why I come to two weeks of bio blitz every year, it's a hoot. Most of the participants have been uh, teasing and joking with each other for six years or eight years. Yeah. Bearing in mind that most of these people are absolutely at the top of their field. The New Brunswick Museum Bio Blitz is a absolute paragon of the phenomenon. I don't know of anyone that's even close to as successful, as grand in scope. Most Bio Blitzes are one or two days. When you come to the Bio Blitz, you get fed like a king. 14 days, you get fed, you get entertained. You get recognized for your abilities when, you know, most people, even in some cases spouses, don't <laughs> think a great deal of what you do, but they do here. So, uh, and uh, when you come back at the end of the day and you've caught, you found a new fungus for the province, or they found a mystery snail last week, uh, there's all sorts of people who think that's really, really cool. And, you can't buy that stuff. I'm doing my own uh, work, and having all these folks uh, all uh, gathered here makes uh, kind of my, my, my job easier. I have fish people, I have ant people, I have uh, everyone he is here. I find it a, a great learning opportunity, uh, being a PhD student, uh, being an aspiring scientist, an aspiring professional scientist, I get to work with um, those who are already established in the field, not just in mammalogy, but in other disciplines as well. And they're always willing and able to, to convey and pass along their accumulated knowledge and wisdom. 
There's 10 targeted protected natural areas in New Brunswick that we're going to. We've, uh, this is the third one, and we go to two, the same protected natural area two years in a row. Once at the beginning of the summer, once at the end of the summer, and these are for two weeks. And so we have scientists from all across North America that come out from all the way from BC all the way down to Texas and they come here and we do massive collection of all uh, species in different, over different taxa. So from plants to fungi to insects to mammals. And we all come out here, collect as much as we can and get a good uh, indication of what's in the province. The amount of diversity just here is amazing. Like we've, uh, the BioBlitz uh, in general has documented species new to science, new to the uh, continent. We think of some of that could have medical possibilities and they disappear before we even know they're there. It's tremendously satisfying to keep digging down and discovering more and more of the depth of what's going on in the environment. Uh, I think all of us as biologists honestly believe that there are that there is a finite number of organisms on the face of the earth, that, that they aren't unlimited, that if we searched long enough and hard enough with enough of us, we would be able to account for every living thing on the face of the earth. But in on practical terms, we know we can't, uh, that, that it's, it's absolutely too complex to possibly uh, get at everything. So we're out here, we're just digging and digging and uncovering. It's a great satisfaction in knowing that we won't reach bottom. This protected natural area is uh, part of the St. John River system. It's uh, associated, with, of course, with Grand Lake. It's a very large wetland in the central portion of the province. This is probably one of the largest uh, wetland areas, uh, certainly in New Brunswick and, uh, and perhaps in the Maritimes. There is some upland, wooded upland that's uh, associated with it. Uh, there are, most of that has been, has been cut over. It's uh, actually disturbed to one degree or another, although there's some uh, very small areas, little remnant patches of, of uh, older growth that are, that are quite nice. I think the thing that's most significant about this site are the extensive wetland areas that are present here. Between Don and Stephen, I don't think I've ever met people more delighted in their work. They're almost like kids. They're, uh, they're so enthusiastic and this is enthusiasm that has lasted, in my personal experience, for 20, 20 years, for heaven's sakes. And uh, they seem to feel that part of their job is to encourage other people to do things. I, I don't imagine I would have pursued my interest in dragonflies and damselflies if Don hadn't taken such a proactive attitude. There are a number of beetles that you find that uh, feed on uh, fungal spores, a great way to to locate them is to look at the undersides of the fungi. Actually, here's one of them right here. Look right here, a very interesting little beetle that's uh, right, right there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. This little guy here, very well camouflaged. In a hardwood stand like this, most places that we stop and turn around can likely find three or four species of ferns in the understory. We have uh, at least three right here where I'm looking and I'll point them out. The one just below me here, you see the, uh, the, the fronds or the, the leaves are all arising from one common point. As you can see here near the, near the ground, all those stalks arising together in a group forming a kind of a vase-like cluster. This is characteristic of the wood fern. They've been around for, as a group for, oh, close to 400 million years. 
not too, too long after the uh, plants colonize the land, whereas the, the flowering plants are, are much more recent in origin from an evolutionary standpoint. Little spring seeps like this one tend to concentrate biodiversity. They play a, an important role in the forest. They provide habitat for species that we wouldn't find otherwise. Good example is a dusky salamander. A little spring seep like this is ideal habitat for dusky salamander. In fact, in, uh, last year when we were working in this site, we, we found dusky in this kind of, this kind of habitat. It's a species for which there has been uh, some concern um, as a result of field work that we've been doing the last few years. Uh, we now know that that particular salamander is more widespread than we uh, had imagined, but this is frequently what happens in the course of this kind of work, species that are considered perhaps rare or uncommon. When you have people who know how to look for them, know something about their biology, out looking for them, they often turn out to be more abundant than, uh, than we realize. In the case of uh, this particular species, though, um, it's dependent on these little spring seeps, not just for habitat, but also for, uh, for movement. And of course, when the forest cover is removed, uh, the microclimate in these sites changes, the temperature rises dramatically, and these uh, salamanders are, are dependent on this kind of habitat. As you walk through these forests, one thing you, you notice is that how soft it is underfoot. And if you get down and take a look and peel back the rotted leaves and vegetation, this is referred to as a duff layer, you notice that it's actually, it's quite deep. It's, you know, it's to go well down to find the, the soil horizon. And uh, in forests like this that haven't been invaded yet by earthworms, by um, sow bugs, millipedes that uh, are non-native, we find these deep duff layers in, our, in other forests that have that have been much more disturbed, we don't find this. We find uh, that this duff layer gets, uh, these leaves get pulled down and, and uh, broken down very, very quickly by a lot of these uh, invertebrates that uh, feed on, on rotting vegetation. And so the character of the forest changes uh, significantly with the removal of this, uh, this duff layer. A lot of the people who Don and I work with closely are, uh, are of about our age. We were part of the Rachel Carson generation. Maybe in the intervening years we've been in a, a bit of a trough and it's not that interest in the environment is, is not there in the public, but it seems to me that at the time there was a very intense interest in, uh, in natural history. There are perhaps fewer opportunities now to, uh, to study biodiversity science. Students have been involved in the project uh, right since the, since the beginning. Um, either well into graduate school or ending graduate school, they may have started right out of high school or, or in university. Uh, some of them, in fact, have become experts in their own right. Dr. Donald McAlpine is a mentor of mine. Uh, he and I connected during my master's at Acadia University. And uh, since the inception of the Wild Blitz, he's invited me back uh, to participate in it, to help with um, the, the field component with respect to surveying and sampling uh, the local mammal fauna. When I really decided that uh, research that academia was, was the uh, type of uh, vocation, profession that I wanted to pursue. That's when I decided to attend grad school and study mammalogy. The reason why we're setting a trap line uh, here uh, along the stream. The goal here is to sample the small mammal community assemblage that frequents uh, running water. So here we're trying to catch some rodents and insectivores that really like being around uh, fresh water.
So this is Paramiscus maniculatus, your, your deer mouse. And the reason why it's so important in mammalogy, and especially in science right now, is, is because we use this, this organism um, uh, for uh, almost any studies in, in, in natural history. Uh, so we really do deem this species to be the Drosophila uh, of mammalian research, i.e. the fruit fly of mammalian research. This is our model organism for uh, every discipline of science that, that delves into population ecology, or biology, evolution, speciation. There's about 60 to 70 species of paramiscus recognized in North America. We also use them for studies in embryology, development, biogeography, you name it, this, this animal's involved in, in, in that type of research in some shape or form. He's drying up now. <laughs> I was always interested in, in nature uh, uh, as, as a little kid. I remember my, one of my fondest memories was actually sitting on my dad's lap and uh, watching nature documentaries with him, uh, animal documentaries with him uh, when I was little. So I've, I've always had a sincere, uh, genuine interest in, in the natural world and, and studying it. I always knew I wanted to be a biologist. I always knew that. I've always been fascinated with the outdoor world and wildlife in general. It's what I like to do. Yeah, we have uh, two species of jumping mice here. On the left is a woodland jumping mouse. Uh, this is Napio, uh, Zapis, and Cygnus. On the right is its uh, close relative, the uh, metal jumping mouse. This is Zapis hutsonicus. And how you can tell the two species apart is largely, um, besides coloration in, in, in some populations, the, the most universal character that we use, the most universal trait that we use, are the, is the tail tip. And you can see on the left, again for the woodland jumping mouse, it has a white tail tip. And on the right, again, the, its close relative, the metal jumping mouse, it doesn't have a white tail tip. And we, the reason why we call them jumping mice is because of their locomotory adaptations. You can see here when we flip them over, they have large, broad hind feet, large uh, hind leg muscles, and a very, very long tail acting as a counterbalance when they're uh, running through the forest floor or running through uh, tall grass in the meadows. They actually can leap quite, quite a long distance for their size. I believe um, one was observed leaping about uh, two and a half meters uh, in, in each bound. So it's quite a, quite a distance. <laughs> My friends have always known me as the bug guy. So going through high school, grade school, middle school, everybody, if they had any questions about any of the insects they found around or anything that they found was creepy with an insect, they'd say, oh, look, there's an insect. Aaron knows what that is, that he's the bug guy and that kind of thing. I have a bunch of standard methods that I'm using for ant collection in the PNAs right now. So right now I'm doing 50 meter transects and I'm laying out a line along that 50 meters. Then every 10 meters I'm laying a pitfall trap, which is a little dish that we put into the ground. And then uh, I'm putting bait around it and other researchers in the past have noticed that these are really good standard methods for collecting ants and they happen to collect a lot of the uh, total diversity in an area. So for the bait traps we use tuna and oatmeal cookies <laughs> and uh, my supervisors just figured that uh, these are the best kind of materials for ants because of the protein in the tuna and the cookies and all the carbohydrates it really attracts them to the area and the smell of the tuna like it attracts them as well. Ants are definitely my passion. Ever since I was two, I kept like little journals of ants and other insects, and it's particularly like caterpillars, drawing them out and watching them change and grow. 
and I just followed that passion throughout my life. So in high school, I showed my biology teacher my uh, little journal that I kept of all the insects around and the book I used to identify them. And he was so fascinated by this that he introduced me to Donald McAlpine. Don got me uh, really forward and uh, working towards my goals of researching insects. And then he got me involved with these bio blitzes. So my main driving force was Don McAlpine. He kind of told me three years ago that there was a need to discover what was in New Brunswick. There had never been work done on ants in New Brunswick before. And of course, like ants are everywhere. They're part of our everyday lives. They're something that people walk into their kitchen sometimes and just see in the morning. Ants, they probably outnumber humans six to one in terms of planetary biomass. And another reason why they're so successful in the environment uh, is they're able to survive wherever we can, pretty much. And uh, they're able to survive on a lot more resources than we can. My favorite things about ants is just the social structure. So ants are, are known as eusocial. They uh, have a social structure where all the workers in the colony are female. And then they have a queen at the top, which is just a egg-laying machine. And then they have males that are only born when the need arises for reproduction. And then otherwise, the colony works almost as its own little brain. And so it goes out collects food, feeds its young, and then they grow up and do the same thing. And uh, then they can spread it over a large territory. They're very successful in whatever environment they decide to be a part of. Yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. <laughs> Here we have uh, quite a large Myrmica nest. And it's just in the grass or in the soil attached to the rock here. When I lifted it up, it exposed all the brood chambers and the various tunnels inside the nest. And so they're kind of running around the rock and their surrounding uh, vegetation here now. With these kind of ants, uh, you get them building the nests under the rocks a lot because it's just, it offers more protection for them as well. So as soon as you disrupt one, they'll release a pheromone that'll tell everybody, okay, there's a danger around. And then when it, you expose like an entire nest like this, so many of them release that pheromone at once that the entire nest is like, okay, we gotta pick up and move. If this like stayed open for a long period of time, like now is probably how long it would take for them to be like, okay, this nest is exposed. We gotta either move down further into the nest or start digging uh, down the slope. A lot of animals will prey on them. Um, some other plants even will prey on them with uh, picture plants and uh, Venus flytraps and that kind of thing if they get trapped in there. But ants actually have quite a few defensive mechanisms to avoid that and that's why another reason why they're so successful. So ants uh, from the Formica genus have an acidopore and this is used to spray formic acid into the wounds of it, their prey that they inflict with their mandibles and this can deter predation in itself, but not only that, when they spray this chemical, it indicates to other ants in the colony that this is an enemy, this is a target, so they all swarm onto that individual and try and get rid of it from the colony. After they've wounded you or cut the skin, they'll spray using the acidophore into the wound, and it burns, and that's usually what you get when, especially the red and black ones, if you get butt by them, that's why it hurts so much. We haven't collected yet, but we estimate is in this environment is um, Aphenogaster picea. It's actually an ant that's a keystone species within the boreal forest. So what it does is, as an ecosystem engineer, it'll go into these disturbed habitats, habitats that have been subjected to fire or flooding, landslides, or even the ones that have been cut by industry. And if it's in this environment, it'll collect all the seeds of the trees that were previously here and they'll take them into their nests and start to grow them. So they'll uh, help the, the trees to grow a lot faster because the nutrient content within the nest and the surrounding area is higher than that of just regular soil. And there's more aeration with the uh, 
nest holes and tunnels. They'll tend to the seeds and they'll allow them to grow because they like the uh, root systems within their nest. It keeps them more stable and it allows more uh, water filtration. And so these trees will grow up and the forest has been known to grow back up to like two times faster with these ants present, which is pretty cool. There's a balsam fir. This is the tip of a branch. It looks like there's nothing too exciting here, just a balsam fir. We know, for example, that there are fungi that, that cause disease on here. This one looks pretty clean, but, but many balsam firs get fungi called rust fungi that occur on them. They often get little galls that form on the needles. The gall midges have other midges that are, that are cheaters and will use their galls for food even though they didn't make it. There are smaller wasps that lay their eggs on the gall midges and down and down and down. One of the things that, that's really fascinating is, is that these balsam firs get uh, uh, what's called the spruce budworm. The spruce budworm, in spite of its name, is quite destructive to balsam fir. And these have been studied extensively now in the ecology because people want to control the, the, uh, um, the spruce budworm. And so they've looked at the parasites of the spruce budworm, other competitors of the spruce budworm, any, any kind of hint at how can we possibly control this thing. And there is one study uh, 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 that showed that there were, I think, six spruce budworm and similar uh, insects, they're moths, in fact, that, that were living there. And there were something like uh, 48 wasps that could lay their eggs on these, these spruce budworms and, and uh, uh, the, the eggs hatch and, and the larvae will kill them. There were something like, and this is off the top of my head, maybe 20 wasps that lay their eggs on the wasps that lay their eggs on the spruce budworms. And so those wasps are parasites on the parasitic wasp. And unbelievably, there were six more <laughs> that attacked the wasp that attacked the wasp that attacked the spruce budworm. That's the kind of complexity that's going on right in this little tip, just at this little tip. A person could spend a lifetime with that much of balsam fir branches, just the tip ends, the, the, this would represent uh, one year. Um, a person could spend a lifetime on it and would not get to the bottom of the complexity of what's going on there. So to me, that's the excitement of biology. Knowing what's out there, it provides us with better knowledge and therefore uh, a better avenue in, in terms of devising and implementing conservation strategies uh, for the species that are that is endemic uh, uh, to this part of the world. Uh, so saving endemic species is very, very important because once that species is lost, that entire uh, genetic history is gone forever. Extinction is a permanent endpoint, uh, as we say in biology. Uh, so that's never going to be recovered. So from that perspective, it's important to, to really, really value those types of species. From an intrinsic standpoint, it's part of nature, it's part of our environment. So when people know more about it, uh, they feel like they have more ownership in it. They, they, can, they feel like they can take more responsibility for it with respect to its conservation and management. So by bringing that knowledge to them, knowledge that they may not have been previously aware of, that gives them you know, lo local knowledge and local power with respect to taking ownership of uh, their natural resources. I've been asked to start off. Uh, Mike Blaney, I'm the mayor of the village. And uh, on behalf of the village and council, we welcome you to your success and your enjoyment. And I'll turn it over to Don. Thank you very much. Yeah. As a species, we seem to have mastered the planet. Uh, we're changing things, climate, weather, landscapes, in ways that they haven't been changed in millennia. And yet, if you ask a scientist, any scientist, to find a hectare anywhere on the 
in the globe that where they can say and point and say, we know every fungus, we know every green plant, we know everything that creeps and crawls there, you won't find a single hectare like that. Now the Grand Lake Protected Natural Area is made up of about 11,000 hectares. So we have our work cut out for us. So we're here in Gagetown, essentially tilting at windmills. But uh, I will say, uh, I'm sure we'll find some interesting things. We've already started to find interesting things. And uh, we're looking forward to, uh, to the next uh, week and a half here in, uh, in Gagetown. So thank you. Quite a year ago, I dropped into the New Brunswick Museum and was greeted by a man with unlimited enthusiasm. Ah, yes, the smell of ethyl acetone in the morning. And you guys are headed to? We're going up to Highway 10. Uh, Obviously a scientist in his own right, he has his own interests. Uh, he's also an administrator as a curator of uh, zoology for the New Brunswick Museum. Uh, it'll be dependent to a large measure on uh, weather. Tomorrow's supposed to be good. Wonderful students working with them and assistants. And so if you see any you know, the usual grasshoppers, bees, say stuff in the bog, if you think. Sure. We're surveying for uh, dragonflies and damselflies. It's a little overcast, but the sun's coming out every once in a while, so we're uh, hoping that uh, we get a little bit more light. We'll see a selection of uh, species here. The habitat's very diverse. Marshes, slow river, larger river on the uh, right-hand side here. So we'll just wander along and see what we find. Okay. The very best way to learn is to, is to teach a subject to someone else. There's not a lot of young people who are interested in getting into the natural sciences at this point, regrettably. And it's quite delightful for an old fogey like me to, uh, to find somebody a third their age who is willing to listen and um, appreciates what you're telling them, but also brings a different perspective to it. So I actually learn by teaching. This is the crossing of the Gemsag River. This is the new highway, I believe it's two, it's the Trans-Canada Highway. The old Highway 105 is just over there. Very popular site with Odonatus in New Brunswick because a number of southern species reach their northeastern range limit right here, or at least where we've discovered them furthest northeast is right here. And yet we have one of the, the most major and extensive types of human impact on natural history, which is the road system. Right here, obviously, it's not impacting too much because it's up on stilts. But the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of uh, of miles of roadway do impact river crossings, they, they change drainage, they, they back water up and so forth. And generally speaking they're perceived as being negative. What they usually do is alter the aquatic habitat of the larvae of odonates to the benefit of the uh, slow water species, which are, tend to be the most commonly encountered anyway and hence are not thought to be rare. But I have uh, noticed that a lot of road work will back water up into swamps, marshes, but most importantly bogs in the area. And in those bogs that are, have been basically anthropogenically uh, produced, we have some of the best records. So it's not invariably a negative phenomenon. For dragonflies, and damselflies, they're sun-loving, heliophilic, and they use the heat to, uh, to help energize themselves. Dragonflies and damselflies 
are called Odinata. Uh, have been here for hundreds of millions of years. They uh, come from very basic root stock in the insects. They eat massive quantities of other invertebrates and small animals, both as aquatic larvae, in which they probably do the, the greatest amount of uh, predation, and as uh, flying adults. However, they're not focused predators. They'll take mosquitoes, but they'll also take insects, which we consider beneficial. a very common but pretty little species. So this is Ischnura verticalis, it's a male. The most vivid illustration of what a real scientist in natural history is are the people that are present at this bioblitz. These people are all motivated by fascination. And when you're fascinated in a subject, Patience isn't really the issue. You may not see what you're interested in on any particular day, and that can be frustrating, but you see all sorts of other things. And when you're looking for small things like insects, you tend to see all sorts of other things in groups that you're not involved with. There's rarely an element of boredom if you're interested in natural history. It's the biggest playground in the world. Natural history is extraordinarily complicated. Even if you know a subject intimately, you can still go to where you are reasonably certain you're going to see it and not see it. So that may be where the patience comes in. I'm just looking for salamanders. For me, the best part is being around like-minded people. Because I know that uh, in my personal life, you don't often find people who are as interested in nature as I am. And then I come here and I feel like I fit right in. Because you can sit at the dinner table and talk about Latin names of species or habitat. And it's perfectly normal. It's acceptable. Everyone's doing it. And you just feel like, yeah, I belong with these people. This is great. Nada. I got a cool egg. It's like a weird larva. Sorry. That was my alarm to remind me to call my mother. <laughs> her birthday. This guy was under a rock. Uh, what is it? So here's a aquatic larva of uh, Imbistema, or mole salamander. So they both have aquatic stages. Is the salamanders um, have external gills, whereas tadpoles do not. And also, for salamanders, they the first limbs that are developed are the front limbs on salamanders, whereas on tadpoles, the first thing that's developed is the back legs. So, if you find you can distinguish them pretty easily. Also, uh, salamander larvae are predaceous, and frog larvae are in New Brunswick are generally um, 
vegetarians. They eat mostly algae. Thank you. It's a green frog. I just yeah. made that noise. Yeah, it sounds a bit like a banjo, a loose banjo string. And who plays? I kind of prefer the name, the common name banjo frog. It's a little more descriptive. I, said, I did not know. Frog. It's during weeks like this at the BioBlitz that I, when I'm in the field catching frogs, I feel like uh, I'm a professional child. Um, I'm doing essentially what I was doing as a seven-year-old kid in Ontario, but uh, now I get to drive around in trucks and even fly around the world, essentially doing the same thing. So, it's a pretty good career choice. This is the Eastern Newt. This is the paddle-shaped tail it's got. So it's. As an adult, it is fully aquatic, lays its eggs in the water, goes through a larval stage, which is typical of salamanders. But then, as it metamorphoses out of the larval stage, it becomes, it goes into a terrestrial stage called a red eft, and it can remain in that stage for up to seven years. And it's bright red, and you can find them under rocks on the land. and. Following the red F stage, which, like I mentioned, can be up for seven years, it'll return to the water when it becomes sexually mature, which is what we have here. Nice find. I'm gonna put him in the water. Where he's most comfortable. I got salamander larva. Yeah, there's some bullfrog tadpoles here too. It's always nice when that happens. You got in the net for me. So it's a bullfrog, Rana Cutespiana. They're the largest frog in, in the Maritimes. They don't have this dorsal, dorsolateral line that runs down the back, which green frogs have. It's thought that these guys are responsible for uh, traded all around the globe for, for frog legs, for food. And these big bullfrog ponds, they uh, spread this disease called chytrid fungus. And there's another one right there. Wow, oh, see? Alright. Sometimes, I guess they are maybe difficult when they're being so skittish, but sometimes distract them with a bit of grass. Uh, bullfrogs can be extremely bold. Oh, see, a little earlier in the summer when they're breeding, and the males are territorial, and uh, I've had them actually approach me when I enter a pond, just to say, "Move out! This is my section." And I've in uh, southwestern, actually, in really high densities where the territories are very sought after. Uh, I've actually had one jump and bite my the net of my pole. Uh, the pull of my net, rather. So, very bold species. But you can work to your advantage as a as a collector. Do I have that? Um. Oh, maybe not. I have one with a large tadpole, but. I got tadpoles. I got. Yeah, bring the one with any any tadpoles you can bring. It's a really tough bottom to work with. It's so hard to work with. Oh, I see him. Or I see another Go one. quick, go quick. Got him. Nice. See, that was new to Big Deal. Uh, do I have that? <laughs> um. All right. Oh, yeah. Oh, they're so cute.
This is an Eastern Newt. I love these guys. Nice. Amphibian in Latin means two lives. Amphi being two, beans being live, or life. And during their terrestrial stage, they're, they're stunningly bright red, orangey red. Well, more of an orange, really. These guys also have a nice orange belly. But uh, yeah, great, interesting species. I do a lot of wildlife photography, and I spend most hours of my free time out looking for wildlife to see and take photos of. And my favorite thing to photograph is frogs, amphibians, but especially frogs. I love frogs. But dragonflies, butterflies, everything. Everything I can find, really. Well, we're going in to the woods to look for mushrooms. Uh, with mushrooms, it's really important to determine what kind of trees are there, uh, to, for starters, uh, because the mushrooms are mutualists or symbiotic with, with the roots of trees. And so what we find, say, with some of these larches that are here, particular species of mushrooms, and if we get away from the larches, then we may not see those species again. So we're kind of paying attention to the type of vegetation and uh, um, otherwise kind of walking at random because you don't know what you'll see out there. We, we haven't been into this section of woods since last year, so we don't really know what to expect. Maybe we'll find nothing. Maybe we'll find a, a storehouse of mushrooms. So, well, I could say we walk in and we look. This is a good spot. Sometimes the colors change even between the time that we're here in the field and when we get back to the lab where we process the collections. So I, it's important to me to make a, a photograph of it right on the spot and, and just record that information. So, okay, that looks good. This mushroom is a species of Amanita that have rather delicate features right down in the soil. So if you don't collect them very carefully, you can damage them or lose parts of it into the soil. So you see it has a big bulb here at the base. And so we know in Amanita, if we've got this big swollen base with some remains of ragged material there, plus this ring, we know this is the, the genus Amanita, which contains some of the most poisonous mushrooms we have uh, in North America. Um, this one is Amanita flavoconia. I don't know if it's terribly toxic or not. I certainly wouldn't eat it, <laughs> but uh, it is probably not a really dangerous one, but I, I suspect it would make you sick. I'm going to wrap this up to take back. Again, doing it very carefully so that I don't do any damage to it. Now it's very important uh, in the identification of these to know what kind of trees this may be associated with because this is, as I said before, mutualistic. It's living on the roots of a living tree. Uh, this is only the fruit of the fungus. The fungus itself is under the soil on the roots. And this is only where it produces its spores for reproduction. So I just put this little balsam fir branch in here, and that indicates to me that there was balsam fir here. Um, I see some maple leaves. I know there are maples here, so I will put this, which tells me there was maple growing here, a red maple in that case. And if I look around, I see that there's a, an aspen up there, and so I probably should try to find an aspen leaf or maybe an aspen twig. Here's an aspen twig. That that will do the trick. And I see here a spruce cone. So I know there's spruce here. So that, that tells me the kind of trees that were growing in the vicinity of this mushroom. Uh, I don't know which of those trees that mushroom uh, is associated with. Uh, 
it would only be through sort of a process of elimination, or maybe it can associate with all. We, we just don't know this. Later, we can study it with the microscope. Mm -hmm. And that's after, again, writing down all the particulars, color, smell. So I'll wrap this up. Take a little packet of it. And I will put this in my knapsack here. Just put it in the box here so it doesn't get damaged and uh, I'm almost ready to go on and look for the next one. Uh, one last thing I want to do is to take a GPS reading because if this mushroom later, if someone should look at the genetics of this mushroom, if I have the GPS reading it gives other biologists some chance of perhaps getting to the same spot and maybe relocating this species for, for further study. And so I feel it's worth spending a great deal of time in collecting this for the museum. I may spend only in a day, an hour and a half or two hours here in the field, but I probably will spend time documenting my mushrooms perhaps uh, eight hours or nine hours in the lab. So uh, this is just, uh, this is the quick part is, is going out and finding the specimens. Imagine what the aerodynamics of a cube must be, a little microscopic cube. Except for this group, uh, it's unknown in fungi. So why does this have cubicle spores? What do they do? Uh, uh, we know from uh, uh, evolutionary theory that if something takes energy to produce, as it would be to produce a cube, that it would be lost if it weren't useful. <laughs> so there's something very useful to this mushroom about having cubicle spores. What they do, we don't know. Another mystery. <laughs> the study of mycology, I think to me, isn't specifically important. I might just as easily have become uh, an expert on beetles or flies or some other group. Uh, I stumbled into it, as most students do, by having an inspiring teacher at one point that got me there. but. Uh, I think mycology is fascinating because uh, they are microscopic things that have hidden lives down under the soil. Uh, when we're seeing the mushrooms, we're only seeing a little piece of what's really going on. And it's tremendously satisfying to keep digging down and discovering more and more of the depth of what's going on in the environment. Yeah, that's very nice. This is uh, a species of Cortinarius, the, the largest genus of mushrooms. There, there are over 2,000 of them described now, and we've, we're pretty certain that there must be another 1,000 at least to be named. Uh, this is Cortinarius caparata, which is very popular among mushroom hunters because it's one of the most delicious edible mushrooms. <laughs> Uh, uh, people go out looking for this one specifically. Uh, even though the genus Cortinarius itself is mostly uh, kind of forbidden to um, mushroom collectors because there's a lot of really poisonous species. For some reason, this one is, uh, is delicious and sold in markets in Scandinavia. In mass, that the fungal threads, the mycelium, that's under the soil and connected to the roots of the trees are total mass greater than the mass of a blue whale. And so this is one individual. This is a, not a group of individuals, but one individual fungus, one genetic individual, bigger in mass than a blue whale, but totally diffuse in its form. It's like, it's like a cobweb um, so that you can reach your hand into it, right all the way from the length of your arm, right straight through 
this individual and do it no harm because you're just breaking a few threads as you go through. Uh, if you shove your arm all the way in up to the shoulder into a blue whale, besides making the blue whale really angry, uh, it would do significant damage. So that it, it's a different form of life, but it's a very real form of life. You're, you're, you're sitting on probably a number of blue whales right now here in this soil that are all physiologically active with, with these trees. Uh, the popular view of science is, uh, well, like most popular views, uh, not entirely accurate, but then I'm rather fond of scientists. Uh, so perhaps I'm biased, but generally speaking, if you look at the way science is treated in the media, the scientist is either a blue sky academic dreamer with no practical grasp on reality, or he wants to take over the world. Personally, I haven't met any of scientists who fall in either of these categories. A scientist is usually somebody who is principally motivated by fascination, not gain. There are no doubt scientists who work in a situation in which gain is a very big incentive. But in terms of natural history where nobody gets rich, many of us don't make a living wage, the payback is the fascination. You get, you get back what you put in and you get it back in satisfaction and fascination. It's its own reward. But none of us is making Frankenstein in our basement, not even, not even out of bits of frogs or dragonflies and the like. And, uh, and I don't think any of us have evil plans to take over the world. <laughs> look at these spores, they're great. Oh, look at this thing. Uh, they look like sperm cells. He's grooming himself. So. Mammals have to keep their fur fastidiously clean because it, it keeps them warm and uh, it's uh, um, parasites from latching on. So we'll save the skin as a museum uh, skin. Prep that. We'll save the skull and, and uh, body for subsequent morphological study. We'll also uh, extract tissues as well. Uh, for subsequent genetic study. And the reason why that's important is because uh, this guy actually has a close relative that we recently discovered uh, in other parts of New Brunswick that's actually here now in the province. So this is the deer mouse and its close relative is the white-footed mouse. And the only way right now to, this, to differentiate between the two species is uh, through genetic analysis, genetic study. So that's what we'll be doing, just to make sure he is who he is. We enjoy our work. Yeah. yeah it's long hours, yeah. tedious hours, but we enjoy it. We're married to the water. Ow, ow, oh, he bit, ow. Don was kind enough to bring these skulls for me to measure. These are wolf skulls. So I'm uh, supplementing my database, which consists of already 700 skulls that I have measured so far, traveling across the world and visiting museums. And this uh, will definitely uh, add up to the database. And uh, hopefully, uh, when I will be finished with this, uh, these 36 uh, specimens, uh, my database will be ready for uh, the mathematical analysis. It's not about the wolf today in this BioBlitz, as far as I'm concerned. It's about the lynx as well, the Canada lynx. So we are trying to model the distribution uh, of the Canada lynx in eastern Canada. And it looks like uh, we're we are getting some nice things. Uh, and I'm here to check a little, you know, a few data about the, the habitat. And uh, uh, it looks like the, the distribution of the lynx, the Canada lynx here in New Brunswick is kind of patchy, but which makes sense because, uh, you know, uh, with the history of the forest cover, you know, uh, the, uh, there are uh, lots of clear cuts and lots of uh, harvesting of, uh, of trees. 
So now New Brunswick looks like a, a patchwork of uh, forest. And this is what shows in uh, the, the model, in the mathematical model. Uh, that's a little bit sad because uh, the Canada lynx has all, almost gone extinct in New Brunswick. The other hand is that we have the bobcat. The bobcat that is advancing uh, northward, uh, I believe as climate is changing, so more bobcat would, uh, uh, people, our authors are expecting that we will have more bobcats coming up and occupying the, this area. Uh, so the, the two species mingle and then this leads to hybridization between the two species. It could be a male bobcat uh, breeding with a female Canada lynx. That's what we have seen. And you see this quite striking mosaic on the surface, uh, different splotches of color, and each of these is a, is a lichen. In fact, you don't really see, if you look closely, the rock surface at all. It's entirely covered with lichens. They are a symbiosis of fungi and algae, so the, most of the fungi are, 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 well, all of the fungi are not capable of producing their own food, unlike a green plant. So now, looking at the, uh, at the, the structure of cells that, for example, uh, if you take a, a fern or any other uh, green plant, that the, the, the chlorophyll, the, the green pigment in the plants is contained within little structures that are called chloroplasts. And it turns out that the chloroplasts have their, their own DNA, and that those little structures, the chloroplasts, are ultimately derived from photosynthetic bacteria that were incorporated into or engulfed by other kinds of cells. Kind of playful uh, definitions of lichens is that they're fungi that have discovered ag agriculture, they've discovered a way to tend and, and maintain this population of, uh, of little microscopic photosynthetic cells that, uh, so they've domesticated them in a sense, um, found a way to maintain them within a, in, in a sort of organized structure, display them optimally to the light, harvest some of the of the sugars that they're producing, and uh, in return, the, the green algae get uh, protective housing. In some cases, the, the pigments that the lichens are producing, some of the brighter colors are, uh, are actually absorbing harm or potentially harmful wavelengths of, uh, of ultraviolet radiation. Uh, so they're shielding the, the algae, enabling them to occupy environments that they wouldn't otherwise be able to grow in. It's really a mutualistic arrangement that they've, they've developed. They've discovered or invented um, multiple times by, by the fungi. It's not one lineage of the fungi only that has evolved this symbiotic partnership with, with algae. It's, it's occurred um, multiple times. It's a bit like flight is an invention by multiple unrelated to our very distantly related groups. Insects have figured out how to fly, as have birds and bats and even, even a few fish uh, on multiple occasions because flight is useful. Well, it's, no one amphibians are, they breathe through their skins, they've been quite sensitive to um, various chemicals that humans tend to put in the environment. Um, so there tend to be, if, the, if there's serious contamination, they can be the first, first species to go. But I've also found amphibians are, they kind of get the reputation as being weak. Although individuals can be sensitive, I think as a group, they're, they're really survivors. They're the first vertebrates to crawl out on land. So they've been Around, they were around long before the dinosaurs, been around around 360 million years, survived four of the last uh, five mass extinctions. So um, they're survivors, but on, at the individual level, they can tell us a lot about what's going on in the, in the environment. Many scientists believe we're entering a sixth mass extinction event driven 
anthropogenically. So humans are causing this extinction. Some conservative estimates are that probably about 200 species of amphibian have gone extinct in the last few decades. In the short term, actually, I'm relatively pessimistic. But uh, anyone with, uh, who comes from a background in, in evolution, shall we say, in biology that way, also takes a long view. And uh, so in, in the, the long view, a lot of the damage that's going on now, uh, habitats will recover. But in the short term, I think we're uh, really losing a lot of, a lot of, we're losing a lot of biodiversity. We're uh, uh, losing uh, a lot of diversity that uh, potentially will be, could be very important uh, to our species in the future. In terms of medicines, in terms of uh, genetic resources, in terms of models for uh, engineering ideas, in terms of quality of life. The museum is uh, purchasing some of my paintings that I do at the BioBlitz and calls me a resident artist. I guess I'm resident of the BioBlitz in that we live everywhere that we travel. It becomes our home. So, so this is my residence during the two weeks. It's sometimes the two weeks seems really long because every day is so full and, and then when it comes to the end it seems so short because it's finished already. Each place, each protected natural area that the BioBlitz is held in, then it's, it's a whole world that opens to us all. I work in an institution in a, in a museum that has a, a strong humanities component to it as well, so uh, some, it seemed natural to uh, some, get artists involved to have an artist in residence program. I can't, can we came up we and it's always interesting when you mix, uh, when you see science and, uh, and art, you see that intersection there and interesting things can happen. Everywhere we go we like to feel that the things that we're recording are, are what's there now and, and that's like a, a moment in time. The idea is to, to go to the places and just look at it. And Alita does a painting and I scrounge around for the organisms. It's a bullfrog. You hear the nighthawk? We find ourselves when we're out in the field doing what each of us does passionately. He does science and I do art. in an area that he wants to, to explore, to survey, to document, then I come along and, and find something to paint. And when I'm out somewhere where perhaps somebody wants me to do a painting or I've decided I need to go to a particular area, uh, he comes along and, and explores and basically adds depth to, to what I'm doing. So I paint as if there's meaning that I don't even know. I, I paint as if there's a depth that's beyond my understanding. Okay, we're going down. We're going down? Yeah. See you guys! mussels that are found here in New Brunswick um, and all over Canada, uh, over 70% of them are not doing well. They are endangered or threatened or in need of conservation.
didn't see the fish, but I touched the fish. That always gives you the heebie-jeebies yeah. afterwards. Yeah. But not great. Hi. Hello. Not many muscles down there. It's kind of disgusting. It's kind of black. Did you get snails? <laughs> what? Did you get those snails? I got snails. Yeah. I got five. I got a handful of muscles. Yeah, I got some too. I got. I think I got pyganodon cataracta here. I though. definitely got a couple species in here, like a few species. Yeah. Uh, but I touched the fish. That was black. It was like that much visibility. Oh, zero. Right. Someone should go right down. That you should only have experienced divers down here. Okay. You yeah. shouldn't take any, no one should be diving down here that doesn't know what they're doing. <laughs> I was, I went along that ridge where it's just the light and the dark. And that's where they seem to like it. Maybe they photosynthesize. Uh -huh. If you touch something and you're not quite sure what it is, you should just keep going. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I definitely touched a fishy thing. A large fishy thing. It was not. It, it reminded but, me of the Saginaw uh, Dam. What? That's what it reminds me of a little bit. black. Yeah. yeah, I got this big guy. Again, the one. He's alive, though. Yeah, that's I specialize in GIS and spatial questions, why certain organisms are in certain areas and certain other organisms are in other areas and why there might be overlap and um, days of conservation geneticists. Yeah, I take uh, tissue samples from, from the species that we're interested in and try to understand why certain genes are found in certain places and why certain are found in other places and how those populations might be related to one another. It's a Lampsilis species. Lampsilis radiata. It's got beautiful radiating rays. Probably why it got its scientific name. There's a lot of pure science questions that are unknown about these organisms, which make it exciting for us as researchers. The most important thing to recognize is these native freshwater mussels that we're finding today are the canary in the coal mine for aquatic systems. So those organisms are the ones that will start to see their shells, will start to see them dying, perhaps even before some of our other ones. They are some of the, they've been found to be some of the most sensitive organisms to things like ammonia levels, um, runoff, a lot of different toxins, especially their larval stage. Um, yeah, heavy metals, they accumulate in their tissues. So basically if you have healthy mussels with uh, many species present, uh, in, that means that you'll have you have healthy water, and ultimately, if you have healthy water, you can have healthy people too. We are out here to collect fish. Today, we are using a boat electrofisher, which puts electric current into the water, uh, temporarily stuns the fish, and we can be able to scoop them up in the front and put them in our live well until we. Uh, until we collect the ones that we're looking for, which is good to have historical records. We are keeping some of these fish, and it can be used for genetics uh, and things of that sort, and for people to look back, to, to look at uh, uh, the different characteristics of the fish and whether or not they're consistent over time. So now we're going to tally the fish, collect them and take them to museum specimens of each species. The anesthetic we were using is a, is a clove oil and it has to be dissolved in, in ethanol. So we leave the fish that we're going to keep for the, for the museum. In the, in the anesthetic until they're, until they're done. And then they'll be fixed in form one. 
everything we're not keeping goes back in the water. All right, so this here is a, a golden shiner. It's quite common in a lot of places in the province. So the other species we got here, let's see. Get my hands on them. Oh, the brown bullhead. They've got spines that lock, so you really have to be careful with them when you're when you're holding on to them because they can hurt. It's our only catfish species. And let's see, we have a white sucker. Again, another very common species. We have two species of white sucker, long nose and white. This here would be a blueback herring. Uh, so here's a sunfish, it's a pumpkin seed sunfish. We have four species of sunfish, including the smallmouth and largemouth bass, but then the other uh, is a red breast sunfish, which is again another and they're really beautiful fish. Not as common. Next, he's trying to get away. We'll, we'll jump to a yellow perch. A lot of people like fishing these these guys through the ice in the winter time. This is a big, pretty big white sucker. That, I believe it's another blueback herring. Gasparo, a lot of commonly called Gasparo. They're usually grouped with uh, alewife. They, they migrate into the freshwater to spawn. It's ironic that uh, at a time when there's an increasing uh, public interest and awareness of the importance of, of biodiversity, of, of biological diversity, uh, the resources available to to study biodiversity, to really to protect it. Those resources are slimmer than they've ever been. You're going to be dropping the crab from this one. Okay, so I'm going to be in here. You're going to be in here. And, and just make sure you're back to the wall. Mm -hmm. Drop these guys off. Okay. Uh, certainly having the students around uh, I think makes, a, makes a big difference. They bring a sense of enthusiasm and, and I guess energy that uh, I won't say we're not enthusiastic about what we're doing but uh, uh, this is all new new to them and uh, there's a certain energy that goes with that that uh, maybe some of us have been at this for a, for a while uh, don't always have or may have forgotten here we're setting up a seine net we're doing a beach seine which we will bring the net out and form like a circle. And as we get both sides around, we'll pull it in so that it forms a pocket. And the pocket will collect the fish. And as we pull it in, the water will get um, shallower and we'll, it'll, the net will fold over and it'll collect the fish. We'll pull them into the beach and take them <laughs> out of the water and uh, see what we have.
water's pretty high in here right now with all this rain the last couple of days. Yeah, that's real. That's like crazy. Anything for us, Bethel? Or two? Be open again. Well, we're putting a mammal trap line out here. Just to see. It's the I don't think we're going to get a lot because they, uh, you know, it's so, so flooded in here, but we trapped most of the other places so far. So I'll give it a try. Yeah, we're just, you know, sampling for mollusks. We had some, uh, out here for fish. Pretend like you're really interested in what you're doing. <laughs> that actually just shows up really well. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you know. But don't look, no, I'm not sure you're showing it to me. That's, That's good. good. That's good. Want another one? Oh. Okay. Oh. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> They're just setting a line in here. I'm just going over here to uh, dip net in a few of the ponds to uh, look for mollusks. So I'm just collecting a few little pea clams from the mud here. We have a uh, uh, specialist who's agreed to, to look at these for us and identify them. And there are a couple of other uh, little gastropods here that uh, they're collecting as well. Can we see that? That's uh, starting to cool down. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the biodiversity, you just don't know what's going to turn up and uh, every year we come out here, you're surprised. I'm just keeping track of things. We had a, a truck stuck yesterday in the woods. And today we've got a boat that's backing up. So I've been getting some text messages from people. Boat. Boats that are functioning. I told them to keep the boat under the ditch today. Well, you're supposed to say, you know, I have I have it written down too. So. Uh, Don is the greatest expedition leader <laughs> ever. <laughs> You'll be surprised at each table, the diversity of creatures from the area. Come on in. Yeah, that's a chicken one. Very good. Mice? Yep, mice. Deer mice? These are more mice. Does that have blood in it? Yeah, yeah. We, we, we caught these today. We talk a great talk about the environment, and children are taught to love the environment and so forth, but they're not taught to appreciate it. And they're not taught that the environment is comprised of millions of disparate elements that. Um, are fascinating in and of themselves. Always the kid that had reptile shoes and stuff. This is a big row in Well, it is absolutely the biggest and cheapest playground the world has, anywhere in the world. Certainly anything that's contrived by man is pathetic in its diversity and interest compared to what you might find in three square meters of your backyard if you look hard enough. So that's, that's all you have to do. A baseline is a snapshot of a situation at a particular point in time. 
If you don't have it, you can't really say with anything resembling assurance that anything has changed. Right now, a major concern is anthropogenic, human-caused change in the natural environment. But unless you actually know what it was before, it's completely fallacious to contend that there's been a change. You have to know what it was. So 10 years from now, you can go back and do the same kind of survey and have some basis upon which to say there has been a change. Would you like to live here if there were no forests? If there were no forests that were developing without constraint and without the prospect of harvesting? It's incalculable to determine what actually being able to leave a road and walk somewhere we have not affected is. We actually don't yet know what the value of it is. You just as well we didn't kill all of it before we had a chance to find out. Yeah, can I take my glasses off? Yeah. <laughs>